Good morning, and thank you all for being here. I'm John Lausch, the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois. And I'd like to start this morning by taking a moment to introduce you to my law enforcement colleagues, some of whom you will hear from in a few moments. We're honored to have Attorney General William Barr here with us today. From the ATF, we have Acting Director Regina Lombardo and the Special Agent in Charge here in Chicago, Kristen Detinio is here as well. We also have from the FBI, Deputy Director Dave Bowditch. Um, we also have the Special Agent in Charge of the FBI here in Chicago, Emerson Bowie, present as well. From the DEA, Special Agent in Charge Robert Bell is present. And from the U.S. Marshal Service, we have Chief Deputy U.S. Marshal David Gellamant and Chief Inspector Diego Grimaldo. Also up here with me are two other United States Attorneys. We have my counterpart from the Northern District of Illinois, Tom Kirsch. Tom's office and my office, we work together frequently on combating illegal trafficking of firearms across our common border between Indiana and Illinois. And finally, my colleague, Justin Herdman, who's the U.S. Attorney in Cleveland, the Northern District of Ohio, he's here. And he's quarterbacking the Department of Justice's nationwide efforts on Operation Legend. We're here today to discuss a critically important topic, violent crime in Chicago. As Attorney General Barr has made clear, the most basic responsibility of government is to protect the safety of our citizens. For those of us in law enforcement, our top priority is to keep people safe. For much of this year, Chicago and many other cities have experienced significant, unacceptable, and in many instances, staggering spikes in homicides, shootings, and other violent crime. In response, the Attorney General op launched Operation Legend, a systematic and coordinated law enforcement initiative in which federal law enforcement agencies work with state and local law enforcement departments to fight these crimes. In Chicago, we are fortunate to have one of the finest police departments in the country, the Chicago Police Department. The brave men and women in uniform have worked tirelessly to protect the citizens of Chicago. The goal of Operation Legend is to reinforce and to accelerate their efforts to reduce violent crime. The Attorney General has endeavored to do so by sending additional federal resources to Chicago, including a substantial number of agents from the ATF, FBI, DEA, and the United States Marshal Service. The Department of Homeland Security's Homeland Security Investigation also committed additional agents. Since that time, about seven weeks ago, when Operation Legend began in Chicago on July 22nd, my office and our federal and local partners have worked together to investigate and to prosecute the individuals who are driving the violence in Chicago, the trigger pullers, drug traffickers, carjackers, and critically, those individuals who illegally possess, use, and traffic firearms. Fortunately, the significant investment of resources under Operation Legend has had an immediate impact on reducing homicides and shootings in Chicago. And the Attorney General will speak about that in a few moments. But even with the success of Operation Legend to date, much work remains to be done. The level of violence in Chicago remains far too high, and it could be demoralizing. Many children have been senselessly killed and injured. And while there are many things that need to be done to help Chicago's violent crime problem, one thing that all rational people can agree upon is that violent offenders need to be held accountable for their crimes. Enforcing the rule of law and holding these offenders accountable are essential components of every reasonable strategy to ensure public safety in Chicago, and it is the backbone of Operation Legend. And with that, it is my honor to introduce Attorney General William Barr. Thank you, John, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for, for coming this morning. Um, I'm pleased to be in, uh, in Chicago to address uh, the most significant threat facing this city, the explosion of violent crime, particularly homicides in Chicago earlier this year, threatened not only safety, uh, but uh, this city's way of life. The federal government responded with Operation Legend, 
one of the most significant federal law enforcement operations in recent years. We have dedicated hundreds of federal government's best investigators, analysts, fugitive trackers, and other experts to work with our state and local colleagues in law enforcement here in Chicago to help get violent criminals off the streets. And I am pleased to report that Operation Legend is working. Crime is down and order is being restored to this great American city. Operation Legend is a vivid illustration of what dedicated law enforcement officers at all levels of government can do to keep people safe. Unfortunately, too many people in too many cities insist on uh, denigrating, demonizing, defunding police. Just yesterday, the police chief in Rochester, New York, decided to retire rather than to stand by while the character of his police force was attacked. Seattle's police chief made a similar decision last month after the city council decided to cut the budget of her department. Other cities, including New York, Baltimore, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, have recklessly slashed police funding at a time when their residents need protection more than ever. This is a misguided and short-sighted policy, and I fear the costs will be devastating. There is no harder job in America today, and I think no more noble job than serving as a police officer. And on behalf of the Department of Justice, I want to thank all of those in Chicago and beyond who protect and serve. The increase in violence that has plagued Chicago and other cities is what prompted the department to launch Operation Legend two months ago in Kansas City, Missouri. The operation is named for Legend Talaferro, a four-year-old Kansas City boy shot and killed while asleep in his bed. The purpose of the operation is to make clear that his life mattered, his name should be remembered, and other innocent victims like him, including the eight-year-old girl killed in Chicago on Labor Day, should not suffer such senseless deaths. After starting in Kansas City, Operation Legend expanded to Chicago two weeks later and is now active in nine major cities. As part of the operation, the federal government has dispatched over 1,000 of our most skilled agents to help state and local law enforcement fight violent crime. Over the past two months, federal agents involved in Operation Legend have made more than 2,500 arrests, many for violent crimes, including homicide and sexual assault. One of these arrests came on August 13th, when Kansas City police, with the support of the FBI and the U.S. Marshals, arrested the suspected murder, murderer of Legend Talaferro the four-year-old boy who inspired the operation's name. In addition to those arrested, uh, the arrests, the 2,500 arrests I've mentioned, federal prosecutors have brought federal criminal charges, federal criminal charges against 600 defendants through Operation Legend. Bringing federal charges is significant uh, because defendants arrested for violent crimes are often detained before trial unlike state defendants who are too often released. In addition, federal defendants will face serious sentences if convicted, with a real possibility of long-term imprisonment at the Bureau of Prisons facility out of state. Knowing that, many of uh, the arrestees cooperate with the government and lead to even more violent offenders, such as leaders of gangs or drug organizations. In short, the basic premise of Operation, Operation Legend is that by taking chronic violent criminals off the street, we will force crime rates down, and the strategy is working. Here are a few examples. In Kansas City, violent crime has dropped by 32% since we lost, launched Operation Legend, with homicides down 18% and aggravated assault down a remarkable 47 percent. In St. Louis, homicides have dropped by 47 percent 
in the four weeks since Operation Legend began, and more than 120 defendants have already been charged federally. In Detroit, homicides have dropped more than 25 percent, and non-fatal shootings have dropped by more than 35 percent in the seven weeks of Operation Legend in that city. In Memphis, homicides in August dropped by nearly 27 percent, and U.S. Marshals arrested 47 persons wanted for homicide. In Milwaukee, non-fatal shootings have dropped by 25 percent in the five weeks since the operation began. Operation Legend's success is perhaps most dramatic here in Chicago. When the operation was announced on July 22nd, homicides in the city were up 51 percent over 2019. Over the previous weekend, more than 60 people had been shot in Chicago with over uh, a dozen fatalities. Other violent crime, including looting and rioting, was increasing also. And the signs pointed toward prob the problem getting even worse with the campaign to demonize and defund the police gaining traction and criminals increasingly believing that they could operate with impunity. What we committed to Chicago in connection with Operation Legend were 400 federal agents, nine, over $9 million of grant money to the police under our COPS program, which allowed the police to bring in 75 more positions, and $3.5 million in technical assistance to support the expanded anti-crime operations. Together, federal, state, and local law enforcement in Chicago, working as part of Operation Legend and our joint task forces, have reversed that dangerous spike in violence. Federal agents and deputy U.S. marshals, along with state and local task force, task force officers, have made more than 500 arrests, many for violent crime like homicide, sexual assault, and robbery. And federal prosecutors have charged federal charges, 124 defendants, including 90 with firearms-related charges and 30 with drug trafficking-related charges. Many of those defendants are now detained pending trial rather than causing harm on the streets. The results of those actions speak for themselves. Over the first five weeks of Operation Legend in Chicago, murders dropped by 50 percent over the previous five weeks. August ultimately saw a 45 percent decrease in murders compared to July and a 35 percent decrease compared to June. In fact, Chicago in August saw the lowest number of murders at any time since April. The bottom line is that Operation Legend has played a critical role in cutting Chicago's murder rate roughly in half since before the operation. This progress has come at a price. Tragically, an officer in Cleveland who has partic participated in Operation Legend was killed in the line of duty on his first day with Operation Legend. He was an experienced detective who had volunteered for the program. And he was investigating gangs, particularly those involved in drug trafficking. His sacrifice is a reminder that it takes a special kind of courage to sign up as a police officer. All of us mourn his loss, and we will carry on his legacy by continuing the good work in Operation Legend, not only in Cleveland, but here in Chicago and beyond. I thank the state and local law enforcement partners here in the Chicago area who have helped make this operation successful. And I look forward to continuing to work together in the days ahead. Thank you. Good morning. The commitment to justice and upholding the law and protecting and representing all is at the heart of our nation. This year, we have faced challenges. And in adversity, we must not succumb to fear. Tragically, in Chicago and many other cities, one of those challenges 
has been the intolerable spike of violent crime, particularly firearm violence. ATF has responded, faithful to its core mission, protecting our communities from violent crime. I stand here today on behalf of the brave men and women of ATF, along with my colleagues from the Department of Justice, led by Attorney General Barr, U.S. Attorney John Lausch, Tom Kirsch, Justin Herdman, and my friend and colleague from the FBI, Deputy Director Dave Bowditch. We stand here today to reiterate our unequivocal commitment to honor the lives of Legend Telefaro and all of the victims and families from that has died from firearm violence, bringing to justice the trigger pullers who terrorize our neighborhoods, like in Chicago, and the traffickers who fuel the violence by illegally supplying them with guns. There is no higher mission for ATF and our law enforcement partners than to protect the public from violent criminals. That is the purpose of Operation Legend. We are in Chicago. We are in other legend cities working with the communities to identify, investigate, and prosecute those who inflict pain and destruction by engaging in firearm violence. We do this with the promise to uphold the rule of law, with the fairness that reinforces the dignity of all community members, most particularly the victims and their families. Every day across the country, ATF special agents and industry operations investigators pursue criminals who illegally use and possess guns, that firearms, that trafficking organizations, that illegally supply those guns to thieves who also steal those guns federally from licensed dealers. We are committed to removing the most violent firearm offenders from our communities, and it is most critical to dismantle those firearms trafficking networks, the gangs and organizations that fuel the violence and interdict those firearms before they are used in crimes. One of the ways that we ensure that we stay focused on the most violent criminals, the actual shooters, is by using forensic science, particularly ATF's National Integrated Ballistic Image, sorry, Ballistic Information Network. We commonly refer to it as NIBIN. NIBIN allows us to use shell casings from recovered shooting scenes to specific firearms and to other shooting incidents. We know this from decades of experience that a relatively small number of offenders in our communities are responsible for multiple shootings. By generating prompt, actionable leads, NIBIN allows ATF and our partners to identify, investigate, and apprehend the shooters before they reoffend. One of the tools that we use, we've deployed right here in Chicago, is our mobile command center. The mobile command center is, a con is configured to process ballistic evidence within hours of a shooting to support the Chicago Police Laboratory facility. It contains NIBIN acquisition imaging units, a test fire room to obtain ballistic samples, and is equipped to facilitate the processing of fingerprints, DNA from recovered shell casings and firearms. Since its deployment in Chicago, the Mobile Command Center has processed at least 288 shell casings, generating over 50 leads. These are investigative leads to solve gun crimes. We have also, one of the ways to eliminate and to really be effective is here in Chicago is by providing our National Correlation Center uh, access. We bring that to the Chicago Police Department. Almost without exception, within 48 hours, Chicago Police Department can enter shell casings into NIBIN. Our correlation center completes the correlation analysis that can link multiple shooting incidents or link a recovered shell casing to a specific firearm. Our correlation center's 48-hour turnaround time is essential to providing timely leads so that investigators can identify and apprehend the shooters who are driving the grim statistics Chicago is combating. And as the Attorney General emphasized, our combined efforts are working. Operation Legend investigators are working around the clock. We have seized more than 500 firearms in nine cities, including 200 in Chicago alone. We are on the streets, making cases, watching our partners' backs, holding the line, and holding accountable those who terrorize our communities. You don't have to be in law enforcement to know that this is dangerous work. 
Our entire ATF workforce has answered the call to protect and serve. This is ATF's mission. We are committed, as we took an oath, to protect the United States and uphold our Constitution. We serve you, we serve the communities, and we serve your neighborhoods. We are here to ensure that you are safe. Thank you. Director Bowditch. Thank you. Good morning. As Attorney General Barr noted, our nation has made great progress against violent crime, but it still plagues way too many of our communities. Um, and those of us in law enforcement cannot rest while any American lives in fear in their own home or certainly in their own neighborhood. The violent crime threat we face today is very diverse, it's very dangerous, and it's much too all-encompassing for any one agency, be it state, local, or federal, to tackle alone. This is why the Attorney General has launched Operation Legend. While every agency here today that's represented has a different role and responsibility, fighting violent crime is a responsibility and a duty that we all share. It's one team and one fight. That's why Operation Legend was established, to marry the resources of the federal government to assist in tackling the rise in violent crime in many cities throughout the U.S. By combining the resources of all these players, we believe we can have a lasting impact and make our communities safer. Operation Legend reflects that team approach, and the men and the women and, and the men and women of the FBI are committed, just as our partners are committed to meeting this challenge. Through our violent crimes and gang safe streets task forces, the FBI and our partners bring to the table what we do best. Prior to and even more so throughout this operation, we continue working closely with our federal, state, and local partners to combine our expertise, our knowledge, and our resources to identify, investigate, and prosecute those responsible for the violent crimes occurring in our cities. The FBI's focus is on targeting the overall leadership structure of our gangs and our criminal enterprises that drive the scourge of violent crimes in many of our communities. What we bring to the table is the ability to target some of the most violent offenders in the short term while pursuing a long-term strategy to dismantle criminal enterprises and gangs. The Bureau has already dedicated significant resources and leveraged our partnerships in cities chosen for Operation Legend. We've surged additional resources to help further reduce violent crime in Operation Legend. For example, right here in Chicago, we brought in 60 FBI special agents in addition to what was already assigned here, to those already assigned here. We also surged analytical resources and data exploitation personnel to help in those investigations. Many of these folks have left their own communities to come and work side by side with the FBI agents, the ATF agents, the Chicago Police Department, and other agencies that are here. They left their own families and their own homes because they want to help, and they want to be here to help Chicago in any way. We've done this to help investigate and take the worst offenders off the street, and with the hope that we can cripple some of these organizations out there. This effort includes agents, intelligence analysts, digital e evidence experts, and personnel from field offices across the country, all working together to reduce violent crime, to keep people safe, and to find and stop dangerous criminals through law enforcement actions, digital forensics, mapping trends, tips, hotlines, digital billboards, social media, press releases, and the like. It's a true team effort which cannot be accomplished through the law enforcement partnerships alone. It also needs the hard work of the community, but I will tell you this, there are a lot of hard work, hardworking assistant United States attorneys throughout this country that are side by side with these investigators trying to help curtail the violence in many of these communities. And we're already seeing real results. Many of those have been, have been discussed already, so I won't go through those. But we have had hundreds of cases, arrests, and seizures which have been made across the country in Op Legend already. Last week alone, in, in between August 31st and September 7th, the FBI alone opened 50 cases. We made 18 arrests and record, recovered 46 weapons. That's in one week. 
Investigating violent crime is a 24-7, 365 day a year job that we do not take lightly. I am confident that with our partners working close together, we will continue to make progress against these violent crimes and progress that the, the American people both expect, but more importantly, that progress that they deserve. So I want to talk now to those who are responsible for the violence. If you are responsible for the violence and you hear nothing else that's said, hear this. We will bring down the full weight of the federal government, and in our case, the FBI, to address your violent acts. If you are convicted in federal court, it's very unlikely you're going to walk in the front door and out the back. If you are convicted, federal time in court is 85 percent minimum time served. To the citizens of Chicago, the Attorney General has used the word will. If we accept this as status quo, that is not going to make any progress. If we have the will to pursue and endeavor throughout these challenges, I believe we can accomplish a lot. That will is being led by the Attorney General and all the agencies here, but it also needs the will of the community. We're asking the citizens of Chicago to trust us, pick up the phone, and provide the information we need to help solve crimes of violence which are plaguing your communities and our communities. In short, we are trying to instill confidence in the system. And I'm asking you to trust us. And with that, I talked to you about tips. I'm going to leave you with a tip line. If you have information about significant violent crime, I would ask you to please call 1-800-CALL-FBI or send us an e-tip online at tips.fbi.gov. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take some questions now. Mr. Attorney General, welcome to Chicago. Thank you. I wonder if you could comment on just two things. Uh, on September the 1st, President Trump said, and I'll read you a quote, he said, we've already conducted more than 1,000 arrests in our first month in Chicago. Uh, Chicago was a total disaster with a radical left Democrat in charge. No, number one, there's a difference in the number of arrests from what you've announced. I think you said 124 versus 1,000 that the president claimed. Well, so U.S. Marshals make arrests on, based on state warrants and then turn those individuals over to the state for state charges. The number I gave you were, were those federal those who were charged federally. Do you share the president's view that the problems of violence in Chicago are re related to the leadership of the city, the mayor, and the president has also singled out the governor of Illinois in making those comments? Well, you know, I'm not going to comment on the specifics here in Illinois or Chicago in terms of the leadership, but I'll just say generally that I've observed the most important ingredients to maintaining safety and dealing with violent crime uh, is a strong police force, a DA that is uh, oriented toward taking violent offenders off the street, uh, the backing uh, of the law enforcement community by the political leaders, both the mayor and the governor. And, and when those are in place, uh, then I don't think we will be seeing the increases in crime that we've seen recently. I think. Uh, the increases in crime, uh, there may be a number of uh, factors involved, but part of it is the emboldening of the criminal elements, the chronic offenders, uh, and the uh, perhaps withdrawal of the police uh, in, in the wake of the attacks on the police. So I think it's very important to, to support the police department and the chief of police in these cities. Do you believe the mayor and the governor have not been doing yeah, I, so? I, I, I'm not going to comment on that. I think we've, we've uh, I think the, the mayor and maybe, uh, you know, I can ask the U.S. attorney, but uh, my understanding is that the mayor and the, and the president talked. Uh, the, the president discussed legend and our desire to come in and to help with Operation Legend. And she said she would accept the help. And so uh, she approved us coming in and providing this assistance. I know the U.S. Attorney had discussions with her about it. So uh, this is all about working in partnership with state and local, and that partnership is working well right now. Sir, what about the local state attorney or local judges? In, in talking about taking 
offenders off the street, are you in part kind of putting this at the feet of the state's attorney? The, the local I think, unfortunately, in our country, and I think that's the case here at Illinois, the system uh, of justice, state justice, is going back to a revolving door system that we had earlier. You know, the 90, 1992 was the peak of violent crime in the United States. It had trebled over the preceding 30 years. It had just shot up three times uh, uh, to 92, and then it's, it's been halved since 92. And part of that process was stopping the revolving door and having pretrial detention of people who still posed a threat to the community. A lot of states are now pulling back from that. And I do think that, uh, and I think maybe John could give you some specific examples, but uh, nowadays a lot of these uh, hoodlums on the street feel that they have impunity to carry their guns out on the street. They don't hide them anymore and use, you know, pick them up when they think they're going to need them, but they just carry them as a matter of course uh, because they think they can do it with impunity and they'll be in the front door and out the back door if, uh, under the state system. And I think that one of the reasons why federal support at this stage is so important is because we have stronger laws in this regard. You know, there's a lot said about community policing. That's sort of one of the buzzwords out there. Oh, we just need more community policing. Well, what isn't discussed and what people have to understand is there is an essential uh, uh, prerequisite for a community policing uh, program, and that is pretrial detention. Because people in the community, and this, I think any, any police chief uh, who's been involved in law enforcement, I saw this back in 92, uh, will tell you that people in the community will not come forward and engage with the police if they feel that, inf that someone about whom they've given information is going to be right back out on the street. They need to know that when the police take someone away, they're not going to be there the next day to, to retaliate. So in New York, for example, uh, which had one of the best community policing uh, programs in the country, it's just an amazing program, it's essentially falling apart right now because of the changes made in state law on bail reform where people are just out on the street almost instantaneously and their lawyers get access to the information provided to the police that served as the basis for the arrest. So that community poli policing program is, is, is uh, drying up. It's broken. So I'm all for community policing, but people have to recognize you have to keep the violent offenders off the street, otherwise you will not get the cooperation of the community. Is that an answer to your question? Two, two, two yes. So, so you mentioned when uh, the operation first started, the amount of arrests you all made and got people off the street. The murder rate and shooting is up, as you mentioned, right around 50% of the time. Well, right now, that murder rate and shooting is still at about 52% compared to the same time last year. Is it a little premature to, to say that this is for sure working and, and taking, uh, driving down the violence rate here? Well, no, I'm confident that that the work we're doing is uh, improving the situation. But 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 it has gone down. It has gone down. It's it's half of what it was the preceding month, and it's the lowest murder rate since April. So, you know, we're starting from a very high level. Uh, and uh, uh, you know it'll take some time to get it to get it down to uh, you know perhaps lo what would you say? Yeah, no, I, I I would agree with that. I mean, very very clearly, Operation Legend helped. It helped stop what we were seeing were increases in homicides month after month after month. You've obviously seen the data. May, June, July, it was getting out of control, and it dropped in August. Drop, okay. drop by half in, in one month. So I do think there's a correlation, and it's a correlation we're seeing across all our cities right now. All of the cities are going down, the homicide rates and the violent crime rates. Now, uh, you know, we're obviously going to continue to watch what happens and uh, adjust uh, our activity based on that. Sir, I have a question. I'm sorry, you had a question? I did, yeah, thank you. Um, as President Trump often would name check Chicago and its bloody gun violence, uh, Mayor Lightfoot and our former Mayor Emanuel would respond that if he seriously wanted to help, 
he would send in more federal resources. And when the former Attorney General Sessions did temporarily send a few dozen federal agents here, they seemed to be welcomed very warmly at that time. What took your office so long? What took my office so long? So long to do what? To send you know, I, I, I described what the genesis of, of legend was, uh, which was with the co with, at, before COVID, we started seeing violence upticking in a number of cities, nowhere near the level it got to most recently. And we tried to launch a program called Relentless Pursuit. Uh, and uh, then the COVID hit almost at the same time we were mobilizing the agents to go into the cities. So that program was effectively aborted. In the meantime, uh, with the uh, incident with, with uh, George Floyd and the attacks on the police and the demonization of the police and discussions of defunding, we saw sharp increases in a number of cities, including Chicago. And so at that point, we essentially rebooted the idea of targeting various cities and targeting the increases in violent crime and sort of tailored it to the to the phenomenon we were seeing in the in, in the wake of uh, of the defund the police effort and uh, Chicago didn't meet all the criteria that we had been looking for in, in cities but given the visibility of, of Chicago and the very high levels of homicide we decided we would include Chicago uh, and uh, I'm glad we did because it seems to be bearing, bearing fruit. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of the public commentary uh, as we launched this program was that cities didn't want federal help. But now you're telling me that we're, we're welcome with open arms. That's news to me around the country, but as I said, uh, Mayor Lightfoot did agree to uh, and, and, and seemed uh, happy that we were coming in. Sir, uh, President Trump has seemed to suggest at times that he has a quick fix for a violent crime in Chicago that can be fixed kind of overnight or within a week. Do you know what he's talking about? Is it involved in the National Guard? Is it this? Can you yep. know what he's been referring to? Well, I think, I, I think it's important. This is a distinction that the media doesn't frequently make, but there, in, in my mind, and I think the mind of most people in law enforcement, there's a distinction between addressing violent crime, which is what legend is about, and uh, addressing civil unrest and, you know, some of the violence that we've seen in conjunction with, with uh, supposed protests. And uh, I think he's talking about the latter in that, which is that there, you know, you can, you can uh, deal with uh, the occupation of areas in the city, and you can deal with the sieging of various government buildings, uh, you know, with dispatch. I don't think he's talking about eliminating violent crime that way. But dispatch of what? The, the National Guard? Or dispatch meaning quickly. Well, it depends on the, it depends on the circumstances. There's some places where uh, state resources are completely adequate, even state uh, civilian law enforcement resources can be completely adequate. It depends on the circumstance, the size of the demonstration and the size of the, the state's assets. Uh, and then uh, we can also use civilian federal assets as we have in some places. Mr. Yes. How many of those 400 agents are new bodies on the ground here in Chicago? So I would say, um, we already have a large number of law enforcement working in Chicago. Um, at a minimum, um, there were 100 new um, FBI, ATF, um, and DEA agents that came in. Um, there were um, several dozen um, repurposed Homeland Security agents as well, um, and the same with the United States Marshal Service. So, um, you know, it, it is it's hundreds um, of new people who came in to help and to work directly with the people that were already here beforehand. So I think there were 200 new bodies of the 400, and the other 200 were repurposed from the other work they were doing and shifted to violent crime. Okay. okay. So, 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 sir, I have Yes. Sorry, my question is a little bit off topic. I, I apologize for that, but I need to ask about Ms. Carroll and uh, how the president was acting in his official capacity when he 
denied knowing her, and also why the American taxpayers might be on the hook for any damages that could be awarded to her. Okay, so this has to do with something called the Westfall Act. That is an act that provides that when tort cases, state tort cases are brought against uh, government employees in the executive branch and in the legislative branch, and the tort was allegedly committed in the course of federal employment, the case can be certified for shifting to the federal courts and the United States can be substituted as the responsible party. Uh, this has become somewhat routine to the extent that the certification process has been delegated to an attorney in the tort section of the civil division of the Justice Department. Uh, the process involves the employing agency, which in the case of a president ha has been the White House, sending in a memorandum requesting certification. That process was followed in this particular case. The case law is crystal clear that the Westfall Act applies to claims against the President, the Vice President, as well as other federal employees and members of Congress. There is case law in D.C. Uh, it, it has been invoked uh, by previous presidents, including uh, most recently uh, Bush 43, uh, Vice President Cheney, President Obama, and now President Trump. The case law is very clear, uh, and there's a D.C. Circuit case called Ballinger on the topic uh, that says that uh, because we are a representative democracy, officials who are elected and answer press questions while they're in office, even if those questions relate to their personal activity uh, and could bear upon their personal fitness, uh, is in fact in the course of federal employment and can be uh, therefore certified uh, under the Westfall Act. The, the case in that situation was a congressman who uh, was answering questions about why he had separated from his wife and he was sued for defamation because of something he said in that answer. And so the court said that elected officials in our, in our uh, uh, democracy, a representative democracy, when they're answering questions in office, uh, even about personal affairs, any defamation claim is subject to Westfall. So this was a normal application of the law. The law is clear. Uh, it is done frequently. Uh, and uh, the little tempest that's going on is, is largely because uh, of the bizarre political environment in which we live and the, uh, you know, the, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. Yep. As they always are under Westfall, that's the statute. That's the statute. The guns that have so far been collected by Operation any idea as to how many of them were acquired illegally, that any statistics available on that yet, where they're coming from? I'll ask AT, uh, Jean at the ATF to see if she has any more specific information. But I know that <clears throat> a number of the cases, because I was looking over some of the cases here, and a number of the cases relate to straw purchasers uh, who were, you know, going out and gathering guns for gangs. Uh, so I know that that's one of the areas that ATF has been targeting. I can, I can, I can comment a little bit on that. Uh, we have, uh, we look at the patterns of the trafficking factors. Um, when we recover crime guns here in, in Chicago, we trace that weapon. Uh, but we find that many of the weapons that are either uh, purchased maybe lawfully, uh, but also go into unlawful commerce by trafficking uh, organizations. Many of the, uh, we call the pipeline of weapons that are being seen uh, recovered here in Chicago do come from other states. Uh, some come from the Milwaukee area. 
Um, every state has a different uh, source, but particularly uh, for Chicago, we see a lot of that trafficking patterns. Uh, so we have a f uh, what we call a trafficking group. We focus primarily on those in particular source states. Uh, to cut that pipeline down, when the firearms are recovered here, we trace them to the last known purchaser. Uh, the firearms trace gives us what we call from cradle to grave, where the firearm was purchased and where it ended up. And we try to fill in the blanks, and Niven kind of gives us the life of crime it led in between that time. Uh, so we do see what uh, we call straw purchasing, uh, lion and trion, lion and buy-in. So those are all part of also part of our guardian, Project Guardian uh, aspect, which is we're looking at uh, going after those traffickers, particularly in uh, to cut that pipeline of weapons coming into Chicago. So that's what we're predominantly seeing. Uh, and that is also allowing us to put resources there in our source states, because I believe if we cut the pipeline of weapons, we would have uh, what we call a little bit less of uh, the use of those weapons. So that's what we're seeing uh, primarily, is our, our trafficking groups are giving us that. So follow up question to that, are you surprised I read about how that you're actually tracking guns that have been used in specific crimes and that are you surprised how active some of these guns have been in a short time period? Actually that was something I was going to uh, add to what Gina said, which is th this NIBIN technology which the ATF deploys and brings into the, brings in extra resources with these mobile units are amazing. Uh, because they can take a shell and link a gun that was used in one crime to other crimes. And I think most uh, police chiefs will tell you that in their city, they could tell you, sit down and make a list of the people who are responsible for most of the shooting in their mind, they think, that are, you know, the suspects. Uh, and usually a, a relatively manageable group or a modest group is responsible for a disproportionate number of the shootings. So it doesn't surprise me that uh, you can find a gun and then tie it to a lot of uh, different shootings. I've seen, I've seen this done and it's really remarkable. And the Nibin technology is a game changer uh, for, you know, in, in, the, in the old days to take the chronic violent offenders off the street you had to cast a broader net. Now you can figure out exactly who's doing the shooting. But if you uh, uh, yeah, I was going to add, um, we, we call that fishing with a spear uh, as opposed to a net. Many times uh, the shell casings, like something similar to this, uh, are recovered on the street. So we take the shell casing, we put it through our NIBIN system. It makes a correlation. It's almost like a thumbprint, a fingerprint uh, that you would do as a comparison. Uh, we, our shell casings are compared to sh different shooting scenes as well as the actual uh, firearms at this one shell casing, which is unique to each firearm. So that's really been a game changer for us. And putting all of that in a, uh, in a mobile unit right now here in Chicago is really what's been helping Chicago Police Department's laboratories, because we can do that now in a 48-hour turnaround time. Uh, those leads that are coming out were generated. Uh, investigators get that lead, and that's a lead to a potential homicide or an assault. Uh, we take those leads, we give it to our investigators, our Chicago Crime Gun Strike Force, and that's where we, we go to work. Um, we always say the technology is you know, great. We have the tools uh, to, to do some of the things that we do, but it takes the, what I say, the carpenter that builds the house. So that's where our special agents uh, with all of the law enforcement organizations working together. So it's the shell casing that's allowing us to make those connections. Take one more. Mr. Um, Attorney General, just a quick question. Just an operation. Well, I think that, okay. did you, you asked one earlier. I, asked, I have one little question. I didn't get to ask my main question, which I'll, I'll let both of you ask your okay, question. Thank you. Go ahead. Go no, ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. So criminal, you know, we watch, we see big shifts month to month, up and down over the years. This is this is not something unusual. July is, as you mentioned, what it was. I mean, it was the highest, it was the worst July since 19, at least 1957, as far back as the records go. But we've seen other big shifts month to month. So what I like, you know, what I'm what I'm hearing is that you're crediting this drop to the federal agents and the federal initiative. And what I want to know is, how many of those murders can you credit to? Well, I mean, that's an absurd, agents? that is an absurd question. I, and I, what I, I did not attribute it entirely, what I said is I believe that it was an important part of that drop. And if you want to maintain the taking uh, fugitives off the street who are armed and already have committed homicide, uh, known gang members, 
uh, and persons who are correlated to, to guns that have uh, committed murders in the past at the numbers and rates we are doing that, uh, not only the federal charges but all the state people that we've delivered over to the state, if you don't think that that has an impact on violent crime, I think that's a much harder proposition to maintain. Yes. Mr. Attorney General, I've covered dozens of press conferences in this building with federal authorities and the Chicago police standing side by side. The Chicago police are not here today. Right. What is the reason for that and why are, why are they not included in this unified message? I, um, you know, I, I, they were certainly invited and could have attended, but uh, one of the odd things about uh, our program in this city are, you know, the, some of the politics involved. I'm sure that was an element of it. So they were, I think you'll have to ask the mayor and the, and the uh, police they chief. Were, they were invited and they did not come? It, yes. Am I right about that? That's correct. Yeah. I, I'm later spending time with the chief. And going on a, a you know a drive around with him. So, uh, but um, I know that the city has put out information about the drop in crime, and is crediting a number of factors. Absent among those factors is uh, the federal contribution. So just the way things roll here in Chicago. So that would seem to indicate there's still a disconnect between this this initiative and the city of Chicago. I you know I'm not I'm not focused on the on the uh, those aspects of it. I'm focused on the law enforcement working together, the professional law enforcement approach and actually getting the job done and uh, politicians can do what they want to do. Okay. If I may. Yeah. To be very clear, there is no disconnect between federal law enforcement and the Chicago Police Department. We work together all the time. They are very supportive of all of our efforts, and we are thrilled to be, help them fight violent crime. Law enforcement to law enforcement level, things are going very well. I can assure you that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.